With the Democrats closing in on their debate date in Detroit, a topic that has long struggled to reach the center of the table keeps drawing more discussion. The word is reparations. Should there be a kind of settlement for slavery? And if so, how could it possibly work? Today is Sunday, July 14, 2019, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. It has been hot of late in Detroit, and perhaps that explains it, the short tempers and boilovers that have been punctuating civic meetings. We've seen it several times now in the meetings of the city's Charter Revision Commission, including a commissioner fighting over a microphone with another commissioner. Tuesday's meeting included the arrest of an activist in the audience. On Thursday night of this past week, it was the Detroit Police Commission meeting that got out of hand. This time the arrest wasn't in the audience, it was one of the commissioners, Willie Burton, who refused to yield the floor in the heated debate over facial recognition technology. Maybe the heat has been getting to people. Today we're going to talk about an issue that generates plenty of heat on its own, the issue of reparations. It has been a topic struggling for a full hearing for some time, but more and more it is moving its way into mainstream debate. That is not to say it is moving into any kind of consensus. It took a full century for the nation to see that the ideals of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were at odds with millions of people in chains. But now a century and a half after that, should there be a making of amends for slavery? Is it even possible? If so, how would it work? Who would be eligible? We're going to wade into a very complicated and sensitive issue this morning. Not only as the Democratic candidates get set for their Detroit showdown, but as the NAACP brings its 110th annual convention to Detroit as well. It's all coming up today on Flashpoint. Okay, we're going to talk about reparations this morning, and let me say at the outset that I do not see a way to host anything close to a full and comprehensive treatise on this topic in one conversation on a half-hour program, not even if I had a roundtable that seated 200. So I say from the jump, this is just a slice of this immense apple. I've brought together a group of thinkers and voices that I've always enjoyed for their ability to see the big picture and articulate complicated, even sometimes counterintuitive thoughts. And with that, Let's wade in. With me this morning from WDET and Detroit Today, Stephen Henderson is here. The head of Focus Hope and the former civil rights director for the city of Detroit, Portia Roberson. From Bridge Magazine, Chastity Pratt is here. And from the Detroit News, Nolan Finley. Gang, thanks very much for coming. I know <laughs> for a little trepidation when you heard what the topic was going to be. Chastity, yeah. let me start with you. Sometimes, I, I, there are some theories that, that some things are just best not being talked about because all they do is raise a bunch of anger and no one is ever going to agree on them anyway. And why I weighed in. Uh, I guess that I'm wondering, is that where we are in this, or do we need to talk seriously about reparations in America? It's on the table. I mean, the conversation is there. You can't get away from it at this point. You got Senator Mitch McConnell saying, uh, I didn't own slaves. I shouldn't have to pay for slavery. And his grand great-grandparents owned slaves. And I mean, there's testimony in front of Congress. It's, it's it's open. That genie is out of the lamp, so the conversation is there. I think the big question, though, right now is when Obama said that he didn't want reparations because it was mm -hmm. a political non-starter, it was going to go nowhere, there was no was political will top, for right, it. Right. Um, the question is, is there no political will because it's so big. If you talk about it, you know how many black people we got in America, how much money and how much of the the wealth from slavery would be lost if you were to talk about accountability for slavery isn't the real question not whether or not we should pay reparations but are we not talking about it because it would be too costly well it would certainly be costly I think it also Stephen gets very cumbersome in trying to figure out who should be uh, at the receiving end of that. Um, it's been pointed out that, uh, well, for instance, Kamala Harris and uh, not being black enough, which is a, a, a really strange part of the debate for somebody white to wade into. Right. But I, but it, it, it's not just that it's so expensive, but it's so complex. We're not even sure where the Yeah, well, the I mean, I think, lead. so uh, there, there are some ways to, I think, clarify the thinking around this this issue that, that, that get away from those kinds of uh, you know, persnickety questions, which is, you know, 
This is not about individuals. This is not about any individuals. This is about a nation that was built on the premise of inequality, right? Uh, right there in the, in the original Constitution, there are protections for these different kinds of provisions for treating people uh, of African heritage. Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes on as a legal basis uh, for the first hundred and uh, uh, so years of, of the Republic. We fight a war over it, and then we spend the next 150, 60 years trying to, to fix that. We have not fixed that. You can point to any indicator uh, of, of discrepancy between African Americans and whites and come to the conclusion that we have not made up for that. And as an institutional matter, that has an effect on black people's lives, not in the past, today, right now. Kamala Harris, whether she was born in Egypt or Timbuktu, uh, is a black woman in America who faces discrimination and has faced discrimination since she was born. And so reparations, in my mind, and I think in most people's minds, is about going back and trying again in a different way to, to deal with those inequalities. And there is a monetary aspect to that, but it, just as much it is about saying we are no longer going to tolerate these kinds of these kinds of differences. But in American law, Portia, as a concept, we don't really see the idea of collective guilt. Um, the sins of the father are generally not expected to be uh, enacted or withdrawn from the son. Uh, if I had a great grandfather who robbed a bank, no one typically comes to me asking for recompense for that. Uh, this is a collective guilt is a complicated idea here that we really haven't seen before in American law. That's true, but I think we we do allow for collective benefits from your grandfather and your great grandfather. We have someone who sits in the right, White House now who probably would not be there because unless or because of the fact that or in spite of the fact that his his great grandfather grandfather father had some advantages that that African Americans didn't have those privileges and so weren't well, able to Let me to... say something very uncomfortable mm -hmm. then that this might get me in trouble. Uh-oh. Um, yeah, it, it is not only white people who benefited from the fact that we have a nation that, that created an economic powerhouse on the backs of slaves. You actually have benefited from that world as well because you live in a modern, the world's most powerful economy that got some of its strength from slavery too, didn't you? Or well, you? yeah, I do, but not in the same way. I, li I live in a nation that has benefited on the backs of my ancestors, and I toiled on this land. I, uh, mm -hmm. my, my ancestors toiled on this land. They built this country, to be perfectly honest with you. We all know and recognize that, and yet we have been structurally shut out of the ways in which we would normally advance, be it university admissions, be it housing, all of the things that are the type of things that I think when we discuss reparations are the things that we want to have a discussion about. You cannot look at the state of black America right now and believe that we are in any way, shape, or form even Stephen at this uh, at this point. That, that the people who, you know, I, I, my ancestors were slaves, your ancestors may have owned slaves, and to say now we've evened the score, we know yeah. that that's not true. Yeah. Focus Hope works on that kind of stuff. Yeah every day to try to create uh, areas where we can be more, um, where it's more equitable for all of us. I've got a red badge of courage ready for Nolan <laughs> being here. So uh, <laughs> what I are got, your thoughts? my and, bricks and, under the Right, table. exactly. <laughs> well, I think if this, I, I first say, if this conversation becomes a central part of the presidential campaign, and you're hearing more talk about it amongst the, in the Democratic primary, without the sort of clarification uh, that Steve was trying to get at in terms of what reparation will look like, because most people think it's just a straight out check. You know, we're going to give every black person in America X amount. I think you're going to put Donald Trump back in the White House, because this is not, as you can imagine, an issue that resonates very well with, <laughs> with white, white people voters. across the <laughs> ideological spectrum. Well, the, 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 the Civil Rights Act w probably wouldn't have been decided on a popular vote either. Oh, There's no. the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. And I guess let's set aside political expediency yeah. for a second and talk about whether it's the right thing well, to do. Well, you know, and I can't say to that. I think I would have to see how it looks like. I mean, who gets the money? And is it just this generation of African Americans? American people who get the money and are expected to say, okay, here's a receipt paid in full. Mm. Do we expect checks or any amount of money, no matter how it's delivered, to end the vestiges of slavery, discrimination, racism? What about the next generation? Will they get a check too, the generation after that? Because I think as hopefully as we may be, 
racism and discrimination not going away <laughs> just because you get a check. You know, what about your grandchildren, unborn, your great grandchildren? checks for them too and how do you sustain this I think well a couple things I, I, we all know that there have been reparations paid to different communities different Actually. groups mm -hmm. uh, it's happened it, it's not anything new um, Native Americans have some benefits because their I land would say was that's taken. a cautionary tale that's though a, it, we've it is. reparated if that's a word reparated it's them to death in many <laughs> in, yes it is not repaired at the same time um, that goes but what no thing goes back to what Obama said reparations there's the danger there because if you give a check or if you give a benefit, then you, uh, you 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 run the risk of people saying, "Well, you got your check. Why do you need funding for schools? Right. Why do you need a reversal yeah. of mass incarceration? Yeah. Why do you yeah. need all yeah. of these other intrinsic and structural racism things addressed? You got your check. So there's a there's a, a mm -hmm. caution there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And why wouldn't people expect that? I mean, if, and, if that's if that's what the payment well, but is the, designed. The to, problem is but that the, that's not what it's designed. So to the do. problem is that it's been reduced to this question of money. Mm -hmm. Right? Who should get a check? Who shouldn't? And it's not about that. I mean, it's not, or I should say, it's not just about that. It is about uh, uh, studying the ways in which uh, this this nation, uh, since its beginning and up until today, uh, has has uh, wronged uh, people of African descent, uh, and and continues to do that. And and it, it, I think everyone should be clear. All anyone is asking for at this point, and John Conyers uh, deserves immense credit yeah. for this. He every year introduced, uh, I think it's for House Resolution years. 40, yep. uh, that, that asks for the opportunity to have this conversation. <laughs> All it says is, let's talk about how this has played out over 243 years and how we might make the next 243 years more well, equal. And, I, and, and, and that's where we have to, think to start. Even that the, was a the question is, why are people so afraid to even have the conversation? I mean, that's what, it's yes, right. money. Ta-Nehisi Coates, when he testified Well, but I also think Congress. part of it is this collective guilt idea. I think a lot of white people think, you, I, I can't be held responsible for something that happened uh, 150 years ago and my family maybe wasn't even in this country then. I, I think there's some people that are troubled by the linkage of creating like but a you If it were free, like, people wouldn't say anything about it. But if they, it's going to cost them something, then they're like, whoa, hey, don't well, hold it right. So I'm not guilty. The there is also, I mean, you can be held responsible for benefits you enjoy that, that come Oppressed on the backs right. uh, <laughs> of, of other people. I mean, you can well, be held for, for helping to, to to, to uh, eliminate that discrepancy. And that's what people are afraid of, quite in honestly, fact, is that they will lose some of the really obvious advantages that it, exist in this society. In fact, where I think that maybe there's traction in all this, Porsche, is instead of talking about a check, we start talking about policies. Right. Um, what would it do if all of a sudden tomorrow we had outlawed credit scores, for example, right. and the kind of redlining things that continue to happen in a lot of different ways? Uh, young black entrepreneurs who can't get a loan to start a business. I mean, can't buy a home because they can't right. their we're credit score. policy there right. rather than right. money, right? Right. Have an opportunity to go to colleges and universities around this country um, and make it more equitable in terms of the admission process. Um, look at the ways in which people are even employed. Certainly, coming from a, a legal background, look at how how mass incarceration has affected people of color versus um, other people. You know, look at how we address even drug issues right now today. We there is such an inequity in the way we have addressed the opioid crisis versus the crack cocaine crisis, yeah, yeah. and and primarily it's because it, crack cocaine was targeting African American and urban communities, so we didn't care as much. Now it's a health concern. We don't send anybody to prison for being addicted to heroin. We sent everybody to prison who was addicted to crack because we thought that that was the best way to get rid of black people and put them in, in prison. And we made it a profit industry so that people would, you know, make more money off of it. Right. Same as slavery. Nolan, it's interesting. Pete Buttigieg this past week put out what he, I think he's calling the Douglas, his Douglas plan. Um, he's been having a hard time getting any kind of African American right. support. A Democrat's not going to win uh, very much without that. Um, but it, was, it is directed at the kind of things that Porsche is talking about and, and policy. Is there any? Maybe. Is there an I mean, opening think, there if we talk about policy? Policy instead of talking about a check. Listen, I think people recognize pa pandering and they recognize ideas that simply won't work, simply Im impractical. I think if you start talking about restorative policies rather than reparations, I think you get a bigger audience and people hear you. I think as soon as you say reparations, people think check and it's, it's going nowhere. But if you start talking about restorative prop policies to finally get us beyond this place where uh, blacks and whites seem to have a difficult time living together and functioning on an equal plane, 
uh, I think you get a greater audience and more sympathy. Uh, you know, at Georgetown University, I think, has set a really interesting example for how to deal with this. I mean, they discovered that uh, that university sold slaves uh, a long time ago as a yeah. way of balancing the books uh, uh, and sold those slaves into, into really awful conditions, by the way, that, that uh, much worse. I mean, slavery wasn't the same everywhere. They sold these slaves into the, possibly the worst uh, position they could have been into. Now they're saying, let's look at the descendants of those slaves and figure a way to make that right with them. I think that's, uh, how can you object to that kind of process uh, as a, a means of just basic fairness? I think the British and Dutch should pay. <laughs> they benefited too. <laughs> they certainly they made money. Just a slice of, again, an enormous conversation. Thanks for the start on it. Guys. <laughs> really appreciate the candor. Uh, we'll be back with more to talk about the uh, national gathering of the NAACP coming to Detroit this next weekend. This is Five Point Report.